the old Limerick Journal tells us that Drumcolor is a parish in the Poor Law Union of Newcastle, Barney of Upper Connella, County of Limerick, night miles southwest from Charleville, containing 2,780 inhabitants, of whom 714 are in the village, and comprises 4,846 statute acres. It is situate in the western edge of Golden Vale, renowned area of fertile farmland spread over Limerick, Cork and the Prairie. A land with an age-old reputation for dairy farming. A land flowing with milk and honey, which is best described as follows. Oh, a plenteous place in Ireland for hospitable cheer where the wholesome fruit is bursting from the yellow barley air. There is honey in the trees, where her misty veils expand, and her forest paths in summer are by falling waters fanned. Sean Curtin on the history of the Irish dairy industry. The, the famous cock butter, butter market was starting to get into trouble because creameries were starting to manufacture butter in, the, in Europe and the cock butter market, which was consisting of all farmers' butter, wasn't uh, any longer viable. It couldn't compete with the creamery butter. The, um, the cause of this big revolution was the separator was perfected and was at a stage by 1879 it was a commercial proposition and was being advertised in Stockholm uh, by Arthur the Bat. Now, the farmers in Ireland at the end of the last century saw themselves emerging from the control of the landlords. There was a lot of political activity in the last half of the century, and they felt that they were going to be the owners of their land. There was a great spirit amongst the people. And at this particular time, Sir Harris Cook had appeared on the scene and he was preaching cooperation. He had uh, employed a very good staff and they were going around the country trying to get the idea of cooperation going. And the creamery industry, which was in the hands of private enterprise, the time that a few creameries being started, uh, was an ideal opportunity for a group of farmers to come together and start a creamery. Now, to found a creamery, and this was the sort of building that they would have to have, quite expensive, they would naturally enough keep to the minimum of equipment. The scales, which is here, would be essential, but in all probability, they would have used only this simple measuring drum, which was common in the original creameries. They would spare the, the, the money. The reception tank they would have to have, they would have to have the separator and the churn, and in between they would eliminate everything that they possibly could. The steam engine would be essential, the um, uh, boiler, of course, the raised steam from the steam engine, they would have to have that. And that's the amount of equipment that you would find in the original creameries of the turn of the century, of the last century. Now, the <coughs> building would be all local material, stone building, and the floors, of course, would be a flag floor. There was no concrete used in the early creameries. The equipment that you see here, uh, this uh, balance tank, or uh, this uh, reception tank, the milk would be weighed in, would go into this tank, and uh, in the original creameries, the farmers came twice a day because the quality was one problem, but the meat had to be hot to separate it, and the creameries normally wouldn't have a heating system in it. And this is an example of the first heating system that was used in the early creameries. There was a false bottom on the reception tank, steam was injected through here to um, heat the meat. It wasn't a very inefficient way of, of heating, but it, 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 it was all right, it did the job. And when this system was introduced, farmers brought them in once a day. Maybe in exceptional times, they would um, have to be twice a day for quality reasons. 
Now the uh, milk will be pumped from this tank through this pump here to a balance tank overhead the separator. The reason for that is that the uh, separator cannot be fed with a pulsating supply, which this pump would be carefully given, and this was the only type of pump available. Now, the balance tank may not be quite as neat as this at all times, but it would be mounted either on the wall or on a pillar, something like this, in the, just behind the separator. Cream from the separator came out on this top funnel here, which is the smaller of the two funnels. The skimmed milk uh, came into this funnel here where it was pumped by this pump out to a tank at the back of the creamery and was where the farm was. The separate, the cream was usually stored in 10 gallon cans or special cans designed for cream cooling. The cream was allowed to go sort of cold or to get sour before uh, it would be cooled. And the only way of cooling cream at the turn of the century was to bring ice from the ice houses. It would be put into a tank in the middle of the dairy and the ice put into the water to cool the cream. Uh, this would be done especially in very hot weather. Uh, the cream then uh, in the morning would be taken from this tank and put into the churn uh, uh, to be churned by the butter maker. <coughs> this little skim pump here would naturally pump out the skim to this storage tank at the back and the farmer would take back 80% of the uh, milk he brought to the creamery in the form of skim. Now a creamery had to have an adequate water supply and it was usually built on the side of a good well or a stream and this would be the type of um, pump used to pump water from the well to the um, storage tank up overhead where it would be distributed through the dairy. The um, pump uh, would be capable of delivering a reasonable quantity of water and uh, this is a shallow well pump. The um, water supply would have to be a good water supply, a pure water supply, and of a sufficient standard to be used in uh, a dairy. The um, pump, of course, was driven from the shafting, and the speed of the pump would be varied according to the size of pulley driving the, driving the, uh, the pump. Now, after the pump, the, uh, uh, after the um, system, uh, the skin has gone out to the farmer. The cream had been churned in the morning, and the churn, of course, was a vital part of that equipment. And here we have a churn, which belongs to the turn of the century. It is uh, a churn manufactured in Dublin by the Dairy Engineering Company of Ireland Limited and it certainly belonged to the turn of the century because the battle is, it does not revolve, it's a stationary battle and it had beaters revolving inside the churn and this is the common type of churn that was available up to the 1915s to 1920 period. Churn here which is a farmer's churn uh, but it's a huge churn by uh, standards. It's a two-man churn, it has a handle at either end of the churn it was a two-man churn, and these churns were also used in the early creameries. There might be three or such churns to churn the cream, and uh, this would be typical of some of the churns you might see in the early creameries. So it happened that in 1889, the very first cooperative creamery in Ireland was founded here in Drumcolar. 100 years after this historic event, a group of enthusiasts decided to mark the occasion by the restoration of the old building to its original condition. The opening by the President of Ireland Dr. Hillary was an historic day, not only for drum colour, but for the whole cooperative movement. What my 
1910, the modern cooperative movement began in Ireland towards the end of the last century and was promoted especially by Horace Duncan, a man of vision and courage. He was dedicated to improving the general standard of living through a policy of self-reliance and cooperation, a policy of better farming, better business, better living. In this work, he was joined by a group of like-minded men, notably R. A. Anderson, who lives nearby here in Mount Corbett in Churchtown. He was the activist, I suppose, and the organizer. And also Father Tom Finlay, S.J., who was a thinker and a very persuasive orator. And there are portraits of these three men in the creamery here, with photos, of course, of others associated with the creamery over the generations. George Russell, A.E., and Lord Monteagle La Foyne were also a great help to the movement. Duncan and Anderson especially travelled the country and addressed many meetings on the value of community cooperation without, I'm afraid, any great success at the beginning. Times are hard and morale was low. And they had to cope with Boston and Lorraine, I think, in those times. They had to cope with very many hardships and disappointments. But the breakthrough came in some color when a group of some 50 people came together to manage their own affairs. And thus, on June the 6th, 1889, the first cooperative creamery in Ireland was established in Drumcolour. Two men closely associated with its foundation were W. L. Stokes and Robert Gibson. It marked the beginning of a great movement that has involved millions of people and touched most areas of life. Much has happened in the country in the hundred years since, but the spirit lives on. The community here was determined that the creamery should be preserved and the movement and its founders remembered. And thus, the Plunkett Heritage Society was formed with the aim of restoring and refitting the original creamery as part of our heritage and as an educational facility and a place of interest for visitors and tourists. But the restoration is now complete but not without great effort, cooperation and support. We could not have done it on our own, and indeed we are still in need. 